As with any good story well told, it has the power to transform lives through raising awareness and consciousness of the issues affecting our lives and by inciting us to act on the newfound feelings that these stories have stirred in us. Stories that transcend mere entertainment and whose messages lead to powerful and palpable action. Stories are part of our DNA. We're wired neurologically to construct a virtual world of language that runs in parallel to the material world. The world of language is more than a mere accounting of things found in the material world. The world of language goes beyond simple observing and documentation. Language transcends description and allows us to make sense of the world of things by attaching value and meaning to those things, and from there, opening the door to the realm of the imagination and ideas. Language allows us to dream and to conceive of that which does not yet exist in the world of things. Things like shoes, bicycles, automobiles, planes, and rocket ships wouldn't have been possible, would never even be made real if it were not for our ability to dream big ideas and to share them with the world in the form of stories. Sharing is at the core of language. It is what profoundly connects and binds us to one another, and sharing our stories and creating stories together is essential to forming communities. It's the glue that holds us together. Language and storytelling is an essential aspect of who we are, and to have our stories silenced negates our identity and personhood. Ancient cultures treated their stories as sacred and determined that it was essential to their survival that people make those stories a part of themselves by committing them entirely to memory such that they could be passed down through the generations. The stories often contain moral lessons on how best to live life. These stories abound in biblical texts, the Quran, Aesop's fables, and the Homeric epics of Greece, and the Anansi stories of Africa, and more. So important were these stories that there was overwhelming resistance to commit them to writing. It was felt that they were too sacred to be committed to an inanimate medium outside of the person's body. There's a story about how the Egyptians came to writing that recalls Pharaoh rejecting Toth, Toth was the god of industry and fire, and he came with an offer of the gift of writing. Pharaoh explained that if he were to commit his people's history to writing, that they would become lazy and forgetful. The same is attested to in the Golden Age of Greece. While the Greeks had a writing system called Linear B as early as 1200 BCE, they had abandoned it only to reintroduce it in the time of Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. The Greeks hotly contested the need for writing. Many aristocrats refused to learn to write because they felt that oratory and statesmanship were more important, being able to win a verbal debate using rhetoric. At this point in history, the Greeks recorded their entire history in their collective memory. The Greek chorus was actually a way in which they committed huge chunks of their historic narrative to memory in a sort of memory relay that could be recited at festivals and dramatic presentations. Greek dramas also worked in a similar fashion initially. Homer's epic poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey represent their history, one that was reluctantly committed to writing. For anyone who's read those two epic poems, you will attest to just how long they are and how impossible a task it seems to have committed them to memory. It wasn't until around 350 BCE that the Greeks embraced writing. Again, it was felt that if a people had a proud history, then it should be worthy of being remembered. The Jews during their exile in Babylon committed their stories to text, giving us the core of writings that formed the Torah or Old Testament Bible to Christians. Writing, words, and stories were so sacred to the Jews that they were embedded in their liturgical, their prayer practices. The letters and the words that were committed to scrolls were considered so sacred that they could actually conjure life. The story of the golem is a story about a humanoid creature made out of inanimate clay or stone that could be animated by putting the shem, a stone containing the name of God, into a recess in the mouth or forehead. Torah scrolls are so sacred, in fact, that when they're worn out, they're actually interred in the ground as if they were human. The point of all this, of course, is to help people in our age understand and appreciate just how important their stories are. Since the time of mass media, from the advent of the printed book to the present day, 
there's been a tendency towards a concentration of control over that media. Typically, this results in a very few individuals deciding which of all the stories out there get to see the light of day. Selling these stories to us is a profitable business. James Cameron's film Avatar grossed nearly $3 billion. While films like this are highly entertaining, the problem with them is that they represent stories as mere commodities. And in this context, our own stories, with their lack of funding and production resources, seem smaller, less important, trivial, and even silly, to the point that, over time, we have abdicated responsibility for telling our stories. Mobile social media and YouTube change that, of course. Mobile social media has given us a platform to speak to the world and share our stories. However, there should be a cautionary note. While this medium helps to amplify your voice and your ideas to the world, it also has the capacity to amplify your ineptitude. I would encourage you to tell your stories, but I would also urge you to prepare yourself for stepping onto the world stage. There are too many stupid people YouTube videos out there to illustrate that point. Part of this preparation begins with becoming familiar with the art of storytelling. This art involves knowing something about what it is you want to say and what is the purpose of sharing your story, who you want to share it with, and how you want them to react. In other words, what do you want them to think, feel, or do once they've experienced it? 